Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Global Read with our guest author, Gaurav Sinha, who will be discussing his book, Compassion, Inc., Unleashing the Power of Empathy in Life and Business. I'm Kate Trinka, the Global Read Coordinator and the Lead Ambassador of the Charter for Compassion's Environment Sector. Our host for today's program will be Olivia MacGyver, but before I introduce them, allow me to tell you more about some of the other upcoming events and, and work of the Charter for Compassion, who is bringing you today's program. And of course, we're always grateful for your financial support so we can keep bringing you the amazing programs that I'm about to tell you about. Um, we have several upcoming courses being hosted by the Charter's Education Institute coming in just two weeks. We have a course called Death and Dying, Grief and Climate Change. And in April, we're offering a course from John Smeltzer called Poetry for Inspiration and Well-Being. And in May, we're going to be offering a course called Our Sensible Nature, Mindfully Reconnecting with the Natural World. I'd also like to announce a campaign that is near and dear to my heart, uh, the Compassion Tree Project. Our global launch of the Compassion Tree Project is just a few weeks away. We're going to uh, do a launch on the first day of spring, which is March 21st. Uh, this project is an effort to bring awareness to the need for the regeneration of our planet. Our ambitious 10-year goal is to plant 7.7 .7 billion trees, in effect each tree representing every person on the planet. Uh, I'll provide links to uh, these programs in the chat room as we move along um, today. Um, our, our next global read is on April 7th, and we'll be featuring the book Teaching for Purpose by Heather Malin. And then in May, we have both Christopher Neff and Sorry, Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer discussing their book, The Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. And then in June, we have a special guest, Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin, with her book, Like a Tree, How Tree Women and Tree People Can Save the Planet. And then in July, Sharon Salzberg will be with us to uh, talk about her soon-to-be-released book, Real Change, which is subtitled Mindfulness to Heal the World and Ourselves. As you can see, we've created quite the lineup and we're so grateful that Gaurav and all of these amazing authors that we've connected with are willing to donate their time for us and with us. So now back to the reason that you're here. Oh, one more thing, sorry. I'll be, I encourage you um, to participate in this book discussion today by using the chat room. Um, it's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use that to type any questions that you might have for our guest today, and we'll get to them in the later part of our program. So you're here to um, listen to Gaurav Sinha and his talk about his book, Compassion, Inc. Um, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest host, Olivia McIver. Olivia is the best-selling author of three books, The Business of Kindness, Four Generations, One Workplace, and I See You. Her work has been embraced by industries including healthcare, technology, education, retail, wholesale, tourism, utilities, oil and gas, telecommunications, and manufacturing. She is a post-secondary educator and teaches in the School of Business at the British of Columbia Institute of Technology. Her philanthropic work has her serving as the global director for the Charter for Compassion Education Institute and as an advisor for the Kindness Foundation of Canada. Welcome, Olivia, and thank you for being here with us thank today. Thank you, Kate. Now, our guest author, Gaurav Sinha. He's passionate about placemaking, strategy, and storytelling. His philosophical views are shaped by the principles of Buddhism. And as a brand strategist, he has authored the narrative for some of the world's most revered international brands within the real estate, hospitality, travel, and tourism industry. Through his career, he has worked with over 200 hotels across 20 countries, numerous leisure, entertainment, and retail destinations, as well as national and regional tourism boards. His passion is to make the whole world worthy of travel by defining and deploying brand strategies that are enriching, engaging, and equitable. He established Insignia Worldwide, which is a brand, branding, design, and communications firm that specializes in luxury hospitality, travel, tourism, and destination brands. It's ranked among the top 100 SMEs by the Dubai government. And he didn't stop there. He is also the founder of Quillen Hospitality, a boutique development, advisory assessment management, sales representation, and third-party operations company. Welcome and thank you so much for being here today, Gaurav. Thank you for having me. 
And just a reminder to our participants before we start, if you have any questions for our guests today, please type them in the chat room and we'll get to them later in the program. Thanks again for being here. And I'm gonna tag off to you now, Olivia. All right, thanks, Kate. Uh, and welcome, Gaurav. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to speak to another author who is on that topic of, of kindness and compassion. And I have to tell you that it's, you know, as we begin this uh, hour together, I have to confess that, that I love the backstory of an author. To me, that is one of the most profound parts of reading a book. And so when I get into a book, the first thing I go to is the Ford. And I won't even buy a book based on anything else but that Ford, because I think it speaks a lot to the, the, uh, the defining moment that an author has, what, that transformational moment that brings them to writing that book in the first place, to opening that business, to, uh, to turning some kind of a passion into some action. And so I'm really curious uh, for our readers and also our listeners to learn more about your backstory because it really kind of sets this tone for your entire book. And so if, if you could uh, just spend some time sharing with us a little bit about that backstory of what, you know, in your book, you, you, refer you reference it as part memoir, part meditation, and part musing, which I thought was just beautifully put from, from your childhood, from the, the dusty streets of India, as you say, to Dubai. So tell us a little bit about that, um, and then we can go a little bit deeper into the rest of it. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I think, you know, the human story <clears throat> is obviously highly relatable, and mine is not very different from, I would imagine, millions of other people, you know, living in India. So... You know, I grew up in India. I was born and brought up in Delhi, fairly decent middle class background. And uh, and like any other third world immigrant, I wanted to better my prospects and, uh, you know, go and see if there's a possibility to work overseas and earn more money. And I remember I had the opportunity 27 years ago to move to Dubai uh, at the behest of an entrepreneur who wanted to open a chain of Indian fashion stores and 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 I found myself with $200 I borrowed from my mother at the age of 20 to start my life again. And in some way, just try and get reincarnated and, and use that as a springboard to, to sort of give some shape and meaning to my life outside of the cliched context of living in India. And, and that's really that, you know, I, I feel in my philosophy of life, I think you can be reincarnated every day. You know, if you, if you if you apply yourself diligently, you can be reborn to manifest anything you want to achieve in life, and 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 really learn from that. And I, I've had a few reincarnations, I would imagine, in my career and in my life, which have been sort of the the genesis of what has led to the book Compassion Inc. Uh, first one was to be able to step away from the clutches of poverty because you could easily stay in that in India. And, and come to Dubai and start a career here as an ad man. You know, and I'm an ad man who worked in advertising and as a brand strategist, I was then reincarnated and I became a hotelier, you know, and I joined, you know, very, I've joined Hilton Hotels as there. And eventually I was there with them for five years and suddenly found myself completely in love with the business of hospitality and travel. So a, a storytelling, a storyteller, became and a strategist was sort of reincarnated in the world of hospitality and 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 i fell in love with hospitality because i think hospitality for me is the front line of cultural diplomacy for a nation you know how hospitable you are as a nation mm, yes, positions yes. You on the world stage so and 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 in a way you you become custodians of culture whichever country you go to where you open a hotel because you're trying to connect people with narratives of places and so forth. And then, um, you know, as a brand strategist, I just, I just found that storytelling and making people fall in love with places just seemed to me like homecoming. And, uh, and I did that for many, many years and um, I learned a lot. And, and then I set up an agency to, to service uh, the same sort of segment because there weren't many people who were fluent in the language of travel and storytelling as in media. 
So I sort of took my learning as a brand strategist and my knowledge of mm. how hotels make money, et cetera. And I set up a small business. And that was the, was the next reincarnation. So uh, an ad man becomes a hotelier, then becomes an entrepreneur who works you know, in, in launching and creating new hotel brands. And um, that led me to travel to very interesting places. I've worked in Rwanda, I've been in Kenya, I've worked in Nairobi, lots of different countries in Africa, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in the Indian Ocean, including, including New York and, and, and LA. So, you know, you travel the world and you start sort of looking at the way things are happening. And, and then you start realizing that you're sort of in a way swimming in a sea of sameness. You know, there's a sort of, there's, mm, a, certain, yes. there's a certain cliched interpretation of capitalism, which is about let's make money for the big boss and let's do it at whatever expense we can. We have to drive shareholder value, et cetera. And I get all that. I'm not an anti-capitalist person. I just, I just felt fatigued by the, 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 the sort of the, the fragmented, and commoditization of one's narrative. And while this is happening in my world, I also, I'm lucky enough to become the father of three little children. I'm, mar I'm married to an English lady and, 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 and suddenly we, we realize that, you know, you're, you're now have multiple obligations, mm -hmm. not just on behalf of yourself, but your children. You have to think about the future and what sort of a world you're sort of creating for them. And I'm a student of Buddhism and I always have been. And, uh, and my wife, you know, we, she sort of separate, started her own business at the same time. So she started running children's nurseries. And, and because she, and she's again, a, a great lady like that. She sort of saw a problem. Education at a preschool level wasn't being serviced correctly in, in this neck of the woods. So she set up these eco-friendly children's nurseries where every child in Dubai is paired with a child in India and we have 500 children oh, we lovely. take care of in our charity. And, uh, and one day she came home and said, you know, honey, I don't think we're being good parents. You know, we are, we are you know, we've got a couple of hundred employees and, and you know, I, I'm busy, you're busy. I don't, I, I don't think we're being good parents. And, and I would like to move to Bali next month. And uh, <laughs> so I sort of looked at her and I said, really? I said, you want in my head, I'm thinking of a million reasons why we'll never be able to pull this off. But what we did on behalf of our children, we moved to Bali and we put our children in the green school in Bali and, and uh, they studied there for one term and we lived, you know, on school, on campus with them. Mm. So, you know, you spend time with your children. You're, I had to take my children to a, to a jungle to get them street smart. And, uh, and it was at that point when we paused that I reflected on what I'd achieved in 17 years of running my business with 180 odd hotels. And, you know, we've, with God's grace, we've done really well financially in that context. And, and, and I paused and reflected and I had sort of my Jerry Maguire moment on our, and while sitting in a rice paddy in a place called Ubud, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is, sort of north center, center, central and north on the hills uh, in, in Bali, if you're familiar with the island. Mm, and, it's beautiful, yes. Yeah, so, and, I'm, and, and, and I sort of said to myself, gosh, you know, what am I doing to create positive impact? You know, because obviously, you know, you want, there's, a, there's a, a conversation about today where success is defined by your ability to consume, not your ability to create. You know, so it's your, it's your bigger house, mm. it's a better car, it's, it's the latest, you know, phone. If you can consume all of those things, then you're successful. But I think, you know, success should be reframed in the context of, of being your ability to create and to begin with create positive impact. So I, I, I sort of, this, I had a, the inkling of an idea that I wanted to write a book about this, about how in a world which is very predatorial, how can you bring empathy onto the boardroom table as a conversation point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really prompted me to think about this is I was working in Africa on a hotel project where, where you have you know, a five-star luxury hotel and then you have slums where you have, and I, they were doing a recruitment drive to recruit staff 
and, and they would try and poach people from other hotels as opposed to try and train new talent because it was easier to just recruit from the other best hotel and give a little bit more money. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I, and I sort of looked at the way, you know, they were in, the, in the slums, there were these mothers with children living in slums. They had, you know, they had all the passion and the need to earn a salary, but they had no skills. So I sort of prompted and said, why don't you start free webinars? Because in Africa, if they might not have good roads, but they all have really good Wi-Fi. So, you know, you could start <laughs> these mobile enabled housekeeping classes that will teach people soft skills. Oh, so grand idea. Great, great, great way to connect with the community and then sort of build the talent pool and empower women to, you know, take roles, which typically you know, are difficult for them to find. And I just found that I was speaking to, to deaf ears. So that also irritated me because I didn't want to work with companies that didn't want to do good for humanity because it's the, the, my fundamental belief is that hospitality is the front line of cultural diplomacy for a nation. So how can you, how can you be a hypocrite in that context? And I definitely didn't want to add to that by becoming the protagonist or the or the or the catalyst who was creating hollow promises so take that thought take my third world perspective on on you know having seen what life is with no infrastructure and seeing what happens you know to poor people in india it's you know which who are homeless and begging etc and i just sort of said you know what we, we need a full hard reboot here I, I don't want to build brands that are not ethical and, and, and able to give back. And, and look at the world today, you know, if you see how capitalism has evolved in the context of going from feudal capitalism to imperial capitalism to state capitalism to industrialized capitalism. And today, we sit in what we call debt capitalism. And, mm. you know, you can only grow if you're leveraged. And, and people are spending money mindlessly they're using their credit cards to buy Gucci shoes or whatever it is that pacifies them today to feed their self-esteem and I just think it's broken I think consumption's broken and and that's really what prompted me to sort of piece the whole thing together into a book Uh using my my philosophy or 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 not, not my philosophy but Buddhist philosophy and principles which I believe are a great platform of empowerment for individuals if they want to try and live a more meaningful life. Mm-hmm. And that's really the genesis. That's what happened. You know, there's a poor boy comes from India, goes and lives in Dubai, sees the glitzy world and helps, you know, hotels and, and builds destinations and brands and <clears throat> then realizes there's a fracture between consumption and corporations, between corporations and capitalism and, and even between capitalism and, and governments, you know, so there's something, something's wrong mm-hmm. somewhere. And maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe we need to either, and and Buddhism, they say God, God is in the pause as much as he is in the pace. So, so I simply paused when I was in Bali, which allowed me to take a step back and write a book uh, where I talk about the power of empathy in life and business. It was interesting, uh, you know, just to, to show uh, readers the cover of the book, I, I love the simplicity of it. And it may, when you look at it, the first thing that certainly came to my mind was, what if compassion were incorporated? Because that's really what we're talking about uh, today. And, you know, you're, to your point of materialism, you make a, a comment in the book that, our possess- that we're possessed by our possessions which I think is a really profound statement that, you know, when you, we look around our homes, we look around our businesses and our lives and how much stuff that we, we have brought. I mean, you make it very clear in your book around this, this level of consumption that we've gotten to, you know, with the uh, great examples, you know, with the 14 billion uh, kilos of garbage that we're dumping into the oceans every day, the the great uh, Pacific garbage patch that we all know about, that's you know, almost twice the size of Texas. Uh, you know, when we look at, at these challenges, uh, what do you think, tell us a little bit more around your thinking around these challenges with this current culture of consumption that we've got and how do we overcome some of those? Where, where do we start as a society or as an individual with that to make you an know, impact? I think I think you start by by being really mindful. I think I think the first thing is 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 to be cognizant of the fact that 
you know, there are two parts to this. I can, I, I have, and, I, and I'll start by the following. In, in Indian culture, we say, you know, the best way to help the poor is by not being one of them. Yes. So, so, so first you start with your personal economy. I think you really sit down and figure out what are your means and what can you actually live within you? How do you live within your means? And, and for me, that's the, the foundation of consumption is born from there. Mm -hmm. you, you, you cut your clock to meet, you know, to, 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 what, what, to meet your needs in, in, in a very, and I think that's what people don't do. People, people don't have a currency of consistent and sustainable uh, livelihood or, or living lifestyles. And that's where the fracture begins is this. And I think the first step is just to take stock of what are you really, what can you really afford? And then when you, if you can afford something, then you got to ask yourself, do you really need it? And mm -hmm. then how does it define you? And I think, and I think that's really where the culture of consumption is today. It's, it's corrupt, right? It's a, it's, I, I say it's a, there's a bankruptcy of beliefs and values because people are feeding greed and ego. You know, I, I, you, you, you know, we have this fascination for the modern, for the sort of TV we watch, you know, between reality TV shows or for pantomime of, of, of the mediocrity of humanity. And then, or, and then, and I think, I think that's what it begins. You've got to just be mindful, just take a pa pause for a minute and reflect on what does it mean to be successful? Now, it's a very important point because if you think about it, the culture of consumption, culture is a cognitive prison. Because if you look at it, if you ask yourself, what is the definition of culture? Culture is a set of shared beliefs that drives natural behavior. It's how I'm communicating with you today. I'm using language in a manner which allows me to be able to convey my point of view, which is you know, being understood by you. So if we don't change the language of what it means to be successful, how can we possibly create positive impact to change culture? So the book is igniting a conversation and challenging people yes. to change to change the language and of what it what how to define success the distinction between success and happiness. I can tell you many a many a fabled story about successful people who are also miserable. Oh and yes, there are, and there are a lot of poor people who are actually extremely happy. Mm -hmm. So where where do you find how do you, and, and it's confusing because we live in a society which is polluted by messages and noise and media and static. And you get, and you know, there's this huge phenomenal amount of distrust. You don't trust the news. You don't trust your government. You don't trust your insurance company. You don't trust your lawyer. And all of this, I think it is really important to disconnect and, and, re, and recalibrate, which is the inner journey is, is the inner monologue, you know, to sit back in the morning every day and create a ritual, which allows you to say, you know, I'm going to calibrate what happiness looks like today, not what success looks mm -hmm. like today. And I think this is what I'm trying to prompt in the book. You'll find when I talk about edifying essentialities, I've given a, a set of tools and guiding principles on what are the steps you need to take to qualify about the choices you need to make. The edify. So, you know, I will not fall in debt. I will celebrate human craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. I will, you know, not pollute the planet. And if you're, if you're making these mindful corrections there, it's a 14 point checklist which sort of talks about that and say, if these things are there, go ahead and do everything you want to do. Buy the most amazing handbag and do, it's not about living in a minimalist way, it's living in a humanist way. Yes. And, I think, and I think that's as sentient beings, we need to understand that we are, we are privileged and, and empowered to, to make these choices intelligently. So consumption needs a hard reboot, don't, you know, and, and I think, mm -hmm. And I think corporations are feeding off that. If you, if you stop saying, if you are chasing a $300 pair of sneakers, then a, there will be a company that will supply you that shoe. You know, but if you decide that you don't want a $350 you know, sneaker and you would be quite happy with a $80 shoe that does exactly the same job, then corporations will give you $80 shoes. So unless demand shifts, Supply will supply is directly connected to that, as you know. So, mm -hmm. so I think I think we have an obligation to change the way we demand things in society, and I think it's happening on the fringes. There are there's a new wave of consumers. I call them altruistic aesthetes. These are people who love beautiful things but like to give back. And I think you know we have to renew that contract with the way we consume things. 
reminds me of a, a book called Your Money or Your Life. And in there, they talk about the state of enoughness. So where, where do we get to the point where we have enough? Because as soon as you cross over that line, you're now at a place where you have to earn the extra money to have that extra amount of enough that we want. Uh, so to your point that we, it's really a self-reflective journey, isn't it? That where we stand back and we ask ourselves, how yeah. much, how many pairs of shoes do we really need? Yeah. And I think, and I think the same thing applies to, you know, companies, companies today, you know, are thinking in quarterly returns, you know, share prices and whatever else. And I, and I how do you really like, and again, I, I challenge, you know, the status quo here. I said, instead of trying instead of talking about driving shareholder value, why don't we talk about holders of shared values and, and work towards you know, creating a mandate which sort of puts them into the same envelope of consideration. You know, so you, when you talk about holders of shared values, the corporate constituents become a little bit broader and, you, and then you as a business suddenly can be a little bit more empathetic in your approach to say, it's not just shareholder value, but it's holders of shared values, I mean the village up the road or the, or the, or the, or the small businesses down mm. in the village next door, you know, they all have an impact on the factory we're about to plant. So how do we make sure we do this the right way? And, and I think this is, and I think consumers will eventually start rejecting brands that are not empathetic and, and, and you have some sort agree. of ethic and sustainability. I think anybody who thinks that, you know, gosh, you know, you, as long as you build it, they will come. I think they'll, they've got a, a rude awakening heading their way and mm -hmm. there's the wave of new consumers who, still, who are activists they wouldn't accept it exactly you know you make a comment in the book uh, it's a quote by buddha uh, we uh what we think we become and mm -hmm. it really behooves us doesn't it to look around our our own environment and to think about that in a deep way that uh what we think we become. Could you just speak a little bit? Uh, it, you know, do you consider that then a step in the journey? Uh, you speak a lot in the book about meaningful life. Uh, what could we do more of? What could we do less of perhaps to get this meaningful life? Did, yeah, it, did it take you going all the way to Bali to find that for yourself? No, I think I could have, you know, I think what really helped was the ability to pause. Now, hmm. If you could have paused in your backyard, if you just take time to reflect, I think this is why people, you know, I, I write in my book, I talk about what I call a breathless society. We're always running so mm -hmm. fast. We're always slightly out of breath. And I think to pause, to reflect and just breathe, you know, hold someone, you know, you love close to you and take a minute to just get out of your own head a little bit and, and appreciate what's around you and, and understand that we are here on this planet for a very little time. You know, so and then and how do you create positive impact? And I, I have a very simple philosophy. You know, I believe that we rise when we lift others. You know, and I think and I think that's in principle what makes us human. You know, we are not savages that that way. So I think and when I talk about how do you look at mindful consumption, I coined the term monastic materialism. How and you know and and this is anecdotal because. As part of my discourse of writing the book, I spent time in the Dalai Lama's uh, monastery complex in Dharamshala in India. And, and I was staying there and every morning I would, I would go in, and it's a funny story actually, I would, I, would, I would every morning I would sort of wake up and go to the local Tibetan coffee shop to get my first cup of coffee. And I would see a beautiful sea of saffron of all these fantastic monks they would come down the side of the hill and they would enter the monastery and off they would go and then you could hear them all day long chanting. And then in the afternoon, they would all come back out the opposite direction and then they'll go back. And I usually around, this, around that time would be sitting, you know, on the side of the street, having a coffee and, and just generally observing the world. And this happened for a good few days. And then one day I noticed that most of them had the latest iPhone and I was <laughs> I was, I mean, they had the earphones and they had the latest iPhone. And I was like, gosh, they're meant to have taken a while to, you know, remove themselves from material materialism and how come they've got the latest gadgets. So I was very intrigued and I, and I took, I took one particular gentleman with me. I invited him for lunch so I could sit with him and ask him what it is to live like a monk. 
and and we had a fantastic conversation where he talked to me about how he uses this phone to play Candy Crush, uh, and 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 he made and he made light of it, but at the same time said that the phone was given as a gift, and you know, and I just I love the the light-hearted, non-associated, morally neutral approach to say, hey, it's not a bad thing. I got given it as a gift. I use it. I didn't pay for it. I don't really care if it was bigger or smaller. But by the way, I really like playing Candy Crush on it when I have some downtime. That's so funny. I, 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 I found that fascinating. And I said, I said, you know what? There's something to be said about monastic materialism. How do you live like a monk and still be able to enjoy something? And that's what I talk about. It's about humanism, not minimalism. It's finding your edifying essentialities and how do you align to making those choices. Hmm. So then if you were to give if you were to give me one, one piece of advice and narrowed all of that down uh, that of how I could make a difference, what would be the biggest thing that you'd want to say to me? It was just one Gosh. On, on a monastic. I, I love that monastic materialism because it allows us the, the privilege of, of being in both those worlds without feeling guilty about either of those. Uh, sometimes yeah, think, we feel we have to render ourselves impoverished or, uh, or naked and, and wanting in order to really be compassionate. Yeah, I think, I think you know, there's no one particular thing that really will make a significant change. I think, you know, life is not about, is not about, you know, one major epiphany that needs to happen. I think, think of life as small epiphanies that flutter through the day. And it's a question of what do you want to catch in your net? You know, so I think they're like little butterflies. So there's no one big, bold, audacious statement I can say to you, which is gonna, you know, change the way we operate. I think it's it's understanding how to respect every moment and be mindful in the way you use that time to do what, to, to create positive impact. I will come back, we, I think if there was a t-shirt I could wear, it would say we rise by lifting others. I think, you know, yeah. and I think it's, it's about, yeah. it's, it, I think that's really where, where I would like to convey a message of empathy and compassion to everybody. And I, you know, today, look how, how dispensable is all of humanity, right? So you don't meet your, your, if a corporate, if a company doesn't meet its numbers, so you fire the CEO, you fire 300 people, your factory workers go home, you know, mm. and that's the tyranny of, of what I call predatorial capitalism. And I think neo-capitalism is about, is about taking the best of capitalism and, and using it in a way that we talk about prosperity, not profit. And I'm not saying become socialist. I think, again, we have this generational thinking of, you know, gosh, we don't want to be communists. We don't. I just think just unbox yourself from, a, from all that vocabulary. Let's say the word capitalism didn't exist. What is this system? Mm. Mm -hmm. Let's say the word socialism doesn't exist and you want you to come up with a new way of thinking. And I think that's what the book is trying to challenge. Say, come out of the status quo of using yesterday's language to create a better tomorrow. It's just not going to work because that's yesterday's language is only going to upcycle yesterday's culture into tomorrow. So you're not going to create another original future. So I think that's what, so when I, even when I'm challenging CEOs to become chief empathy officers, it's about changing culture. And how, how fortunate, how lucky have you been in making some of those changes to those organizations and to those CEOs? You know, I'm, I'm, we are, and we're very, very proud of the fact that there are people out there who listen. I think, you know, we are making small, taking small steps, you know, but I think the most important thing is that we are living by those principles ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are both insignia and, and, and homegrown. We have 500 children that we take care of. It's a drop in the ocean compared to, you know, the billionaires with their foundations and whatnot. But as, as a couple, two people on the planet, you know, with self-employed individuals, we are, we are trying to do that. So I think we are living, we are living what, what I've written in the book, you mm -hmm. know, and we apply those principles. My, my team is allowed to what volunteer its time in India. If they want to work at our charity, we pay for their flights, we put them up and all the rest of it. And, and I think it's easy to give back. And I think this is, if, if you're, if you're motivated enough to find a way, yeah, and this is mm -hmm. where I feel that all everybody has to stand up and address this, right? If I wanted to transfer money from New York to Manila, it'll take me less than a minute. Let me ask you, how do you transfer your goodwill to Manila? 
Mm. Goodwill is so Beautiful. sticky. It, goodwill only moves within within your name within your community your, your local parish. How do you take it further? How do you know it's authentically delivered? How do you measure it? Where is the impact? And how can you do that while you while you're drinking a coffee? Because it can happen. You can be at Starbucks and feed somebody in a soup kitchen in Thailand. It can happen. It's just a question of aligning ourselves to make those choices because there are companies out there trying to do that. Exactly. And so let's actually move a little bit more from the self over to, uh, to organizations. Uh, when we take a look at some companies, public traded companies specifically, how, um, how can they focus uh, on the shareholder value, because of course that's, you know, always what they're, you know, how can they, you, you reference in the book about higher purpose. So how can they, these public traded companies focus on shareholder value for this higher purpose of compassion? So as an example, I think of a company in Vancouver, uh, Canada, where I live called Van City, and they are the largest community-based credit union in the world. And they have, if you stand outside of one of their buildings, they have this outside of every one of them, it says, uh, we make good money. And that really is the, the premise of their whole philosophy is to, mm. is to make good money. And so from foundations that they have to uh, real estate deals for affordable housing uh, in a very expensive city, uh, you, their credit cards, uh, the money goes back, doesn't go back to you, the money goes back to environmental NGOs. So I find that fascinating. I mean, they really should, uh, they really could be the poster children for your book by the way that they, the way that they've taken money and they've turned it into this, this sense. So is there, you know, from your observations, do you have some examples of other companies that are doing some really amazing yeah. shareholder yeah. value on that side? Yeah, there's a chapter in my book called Citizens of Compassion where I give many examples of a number of companies which are doing good and doing great. Um, you know, Patagonia as a clothing company has been doing it for the environment for ages, but just mindful consumption. Again, it's the anti-fast fashion brand in many ways. You know, they, 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 they were cool before, you know, anything in the context of being sort of these activists about the environment and saving the planet and the Amazon and all the deforestation in the late 70s, early 80s. You know, these were outliers uh, and they've continued to be highly successful even today. There are companies out there which are doing great jobs, you know, with regards to giving, creating positive impact. And I think altruistic capitalism is not a mutually exclusive component. You know, you do, who said you can't make money and be charitable? charitable? Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, the, the typical conversation is charity is a personal affair. I'll decide what I want to give away, but the company has to make millions first and, and at any expense because we have to drive shareholder value. And I think and I think this linear thinking of giving back is a broken phenomena. I think there is, there is unity in being able to galvanize yourself, to be able to deploy your talent, your resources, to, 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 to lift and be, be profitable, if you know it. And that's what I, in my book, I, I, you know, I, I, ironically, I failed every, in all my algebra classes in school. Uh, I was terrible at it, and, and, but in my book, I actually created a formula which allows you to measure and implement your sort of empathy quotient in your, in your in, you know, and I called it, instead of ROI, I talk about, which ROI being return on investment, I talk about ROE, mm -hmm. which is return, return on empathy, and return on empathy is, 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 uh, and how do you measure it? I said, it's E, it's equitable return on investment plus positive social impact equals return on empathy. So it's equitable returns. Is 35%, 40%, 50% good enough? Or do you want 700% growth? Mm. What is equitable? And how do you define an equitable? So equitable based on holders of shared values, not just shareholder value. I think by just, just, broadening the lens a little bit, you have so much more clarity. If you look at equitable return on investment and then you assign it to positive social impact, because in, you know, all companies in the world might have different shareholders, but you, all companies in the world only have one, or they, they, all companies have the same corporate constituents. It's the planet and the people. 
These are the mm. two defining corporate constituents. It doesn't matter if you're running uh, a laundry shop in New York or whether you're running you know, the largest tech giant in Silicon Valley. It's the planet and the people. So if you can create positive social impact for the planet and the people while you're making equitable, equitable profitability for your holders of shared values, then I genuinely feel you've got, you've got, you've got the, the sort of the secret sauce. Mm. And I think brands in the future can, and can achieve that, in my opinion. Well, you know, as a college educator, I'm always very, you know, very passionate about emerging leaders, these young emerging leaders that are coming out. So if, uh, if, I, if I were to go back and talk to my students about as young entrepreneurs, you know, what would you want to tell them around, around that concept? That's something that they, that they could do as an entrepreneur to around so my first sense of empathy. Salt, so that, you know, I, I could sound like a bumper sticker here, but, you know, I'm going to try and give you <laughs> my top this is but Number one, I believe anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur should only do what they love uh, and, and something they're deeply passionate about. I think without passion, you can't solve anything. Uh, and I think you have to solve a problem in the context of what you're doing, but you must have a profoundly higher, a higher purpose, a higher purpose that transcends money. I think in life, you know, I'm as a businessman, you know, been, my primitive mind doesn't use, doesn't use instruments of debt. I have no debt. Thank God for that. You know, I don't take money from the bank to, have, to grow my business. If I have it, I spend it. And I, and I think business, the entrepreneurs have to have a higher purpose, a purpose that transcends profitability. They have to solve a problem which also creates positive impact for society. I think the, and you've got to be passionate and positive and resilient and persistent if you want to make all of these things come to life. And that's, mm. and you know, you don't need an MBA to become great, a, a great entrepreneur. You, you, and, I, and I have a very simple way of looking at it. Good human values, make great business values. Mm. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, at the end of the, your book, you're, and I'm, I'm going to uh, start opening up for questions because I have a feeling we have a lot of questions. I can see a lot going on in the, the chat box. Uh, but, you know, at the end of your book, you make a comment about it's, um, it's morality and materialism. And I'm curious, you didn't say and or, you made a very clear point around this and. Can you just speak to that a little bit, this morality and materialism? Yeah, I think, I think it, this alludes back to the conversation we had earlier about just making ethical choices, you know, just being, being honest, being able to understand that, you know, literally it's just having a value mechanism that doesn't, that, that works towards nurturing not necessarily diluting, you know, whatever it is in your ecosystem that you're connected with. And, and materialism, so when I talk, it's really tough, it comes back to monastic materialism, good morals, being ethically correct, stand straight, you know, do, do right by others, do right by yourself. It begins with self-compassion. I honestly believe you can't be kind to others unless you can be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you have to balance that. You have to learn how to be kind to yourself, but that doesn't mean by you going and buying yourself jewelry you can't afford on, on a credit card that you can't pay back, you know? So mm -hmm. how do you learn self-compassion? And in my book, when I talk about monastic materialism, I talk about self-compassion and selfless compassion. I talk about, you know, rational intent and action and emotional intent and action. And I have got steps that allow you to live by those principles. And once you've done that and you've you know, taken care of your personal economy, you've fortified it, then give to charity, then, then support others. Now, that charity doesn't need to be financial. It could be your time. It could be you inclined to give, give back to the community in different ways. So you know, there are various ways to be patrons without necessarily falling into writing checks to people. Yes. And I think there's a very different feeling too when you uh, you're, you're speaking more about you know, getting your hands into it as opposed to just writing that check. I think there's a different something physiologically that goes on when you have that experience. So true. So true. Yeah, and I think don't be part of the problem. You know, like you you I don't, I don't want a next generation of entrepreneurs to clone you know what granddaddy or daddy's version of bling means, and then suddenly find yourself that they're all chasing the Ferrari. 
and that's the end of that. And you know, there you have the tyranny of a new generation changing the same level mm. of you know, you know, consumption that they can't afford to either feed or if they can afford to feed it, you know, they can do it, but as long as they're doing other things along with it. I think you have a you have a social obligation as as human beings now. Right. And I think we have to talk about this. Look, the issues in the world when it comes to identity, you know, people don't know whether what it means to be British or what it means to be Indian or what it means to be American. We've got massive issues happening in the world, in society today. You've got a lot of and, and I think, you know, and this is where brands have in a way hijacked the fractured ideologies of the past because they have become the new religions. And in a way, that's what we've got to do. You know, we've got to create a language of ideology that we believe mm. is sustainable. So, so and I think there is a lot to be said. I don't necessarily claim to have all the answers, but to entrepreneurs, I'd say do business that your mother understands. Don't complicate it. Mm -hmm. You know, just keep mm -hmm. it simple. You know, I think simple things have tremendous elegance. Well, and with that elegance, uh, you know, the a lot of the work that I do uh, takes you from the front line to the boardroom. And when you, from, from your thinking around uh, what is your philosophy around maybe bringing some of these concepts into organizations? Do you think it's from the grassroots level with those frontline uh, folks or from the, from the boardroom down I mean, where there's different approaches to bringing in these kinds of philosophies? Where do you think it's they're really, going to set? It's a, really good, it's a really good question. And, you know, and in my opinion, it, there's an element of both. You know, I think there is, and we should not undermine the power and, and intelligence amongst the global youth today. They are so well attuned to what's happening mm -hmm. in the world. They are empowered, they have income, they have, they have the ability and the energy and the knowledge to be able to create positive change in society. They're not to be under, under, undermined. And I think within that fragile soil of global youth, the, the, many a plant will blossom with great ideas that are going to do great positive things. And I think, you know, like a plant needs sunshine, if there is leadership sitting in large corporations which have the ability to empower these young uh, ide ideators, innovators, futurists, I think if there is a platform that allows for a conscientious capitalism conversation to occur, which I believe is also happening. I think, you know, you're, you've got a chart of a compassion sitting in the context of this call. We had a hundred uh, of your largest American businesses at the conscious capitalism round table uh, recently in the United mm. States in New York a few months ago. And I think there are other the government can play its own role by giving tax incentives to businesses that are trying to do good. Listen, the reality is in most of the world, you know, if you were, if I was a coal miner and I was making a profit of $3 million, I'd pay the same tax in, as I would if I was looking at solar power. You, you know, government's tax income agnostic to where the money's coming from. So maybe, and, and those instruments can also be refined. Governments can be far more refined in the granularity of how they incentivize, uh, you know, industries or businesses which are trying to do good. And I don't think it's happening as effectively. You might have a handful of countries which are sophisticated enough in their ability to empower some of these individuals, but most of these individuals don't get those opportunities. Mm. You can deploy that capital better. And I think we need a new currency of goodwill. We need to transfer, you know, you manipulate your tax, your, your, you know, your income to, to sort of not pay the maximum tax. You've got, you know, companies which are registered in tax havens to avoid paying tax to anyone. You've got zero hour employee mm -hmm. contracts out there, you know, so you can hire and fire without any liabilities being incurred. So I think, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the ideal, it's not an ideal situation. It's one of the reasons I believe that starting with grassroots with the frontline employees, a lot of times can give us some, some real bench strength. Uh, because they can. Sorry, I lost you there. What did? So oh, what was uh, just uh, speaking on how starting with frontline employees a lot of times, uh, rather than with the board or at that top level, because sometimes getting them to buy into some of those concepts and principles, where these frontline employees can kind of create this mass uh, ground swell of of what they would like to do and bringing those values forward. So I think there's a, there's an opportunity for both of those in there. That is, that's a real strength that sometimes we forget about those folks on the front line. Yeah. And I think, you know, these people, you know, today, 
those who are in a position to be able to make a choice as opposed mm-hmm. to be forced to work. I think those choices are already leading where they are looking to seek employment with companies that have a conscientious compass of sorts. Yes. You know, I think people are, people are now asking hard questions as to how do you deploy your profit? What do you do for the planet? Mm-hmm. How you, it's not in the old days you would have CSR, you know, when I talk about, you know, CSR as corporate social responsibility, I talk about, you know, compassionate, sustainable responsibility. So I think compassion and sustainability are the front line of what we need to think of when it comes to CSR. And I, and I think these are the conversations that a lot of people are asking. And I think companies will have to build their ethical and sustainable initiatives and programs in order to attract the best talent. Otherwise, the best yeah, talent will, will move to other businesses, which actually stand for something more than just making money. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot more power than what they realize they do. I can see that uh, Kate's on. Kate, do you have some questions that are coming in? I do. First of all, wow, this has been really wonderful. Thank you both so much. Um, I, there's just some really interesting comments that I hope I can share with you um, later, but I do want to get to the couple of questions too. Um, one person asked, what do you say to the greed is good folks out there who would disagree with you? Mm, no. I think I'd say good luck to you, you know, so that's one part of it. <laughs> You know, it's, it's a tough one. I have some friends of mine who work in private equity and, and we don't see eye to eye on this subject. And, and, and they will always come up with a huge argument about, you know, how, um, how corporations are, you know, the, the risk taker takes the money and takes the reward. But I think if you take a step back and think about, you know, we talk about corporations and if you think about how, how a corporations created in, and where we are today, mm. now, you know, a limited liability company, an LLC, was a, was a privilege given to an individual by a sovereign government in their quest to do good for society. That is the original mm. instrument of an LLC. That's how it was created. And mm. in the post-industrialized era, the, the, the shift of corporations and the role was about organizing labor. It was a dry, it was an, it was a platform to organize labor. Henry Ford wanted to build cars. He needed 3000 employees. So a corporation and salaried employment was a consequence of organizing labor in the post industrialized era, because before the industrialized era, people were blacksmiths and farmers and work somewhere or the other. And it was imperial and feudal, feudal capitalism, right? So people weren't getting salary jobs alone. There was, you know, it was, a, if, if you, it was a much bigger, broader, diverse mixed bag of semi-skilled quasi-entrepreneurial hybrid models that existed that created economy and income for people. You'd pay rent on a plot of land, you'll grow wheat and you'll give some of it away as tax and you'll eat the rest and then you'll get, do other things. So the, a limited liable, liability company was an instrument created for individuals in their quest to do good for society. And if they failed, they would not go to prison. It would be limited and they would not be put to jail. That was in print. And, I, and again, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on this matter. I'm giving you the gist of it. And, and today what has happened is corporations have broken that contract with society. Now it's all about shareholder conversation. Some of you have been brainwashed to say, hey, is that really what a private company was meant to do? So there's a conversation on that. I think people need to go back and study the history of what makes a good corporation and what, and what, and what a limited liability corporation's core tenets are and what, it contracts, what its contract needs to be with society. So there's some fundamental, some fundamental things to be understand. So the, the people who think that they can use an LLC as a predatory way based on greed to accumulate are actually monetizing ignorance of humanity. Mm. Wow. Nicely said. Yeah, very mm-hmm. nice. So I, I have another question from our audience. Um, how does the concept of unions fit into today's responsibility and sustainability? Do you know, I'm not an expert on this subject matter of unions and how 
you know, and I, and I think it's a fascinating question and I intend to spend the next few days researching, you know, how this all came about. But I think, I think for me, what a union equates to is, is the strength of the collective. I think that's what it comes to. And I think if the strength of the collective is deployed to create an equitable environment which of income for the, for the collective and the, the sort of the owner of the business, then I think the same power can be unleashed to create positive impact. And I think, and I think even unions should have their own, uh, should have their own code of ethics and giving back and sustainability outside of the members of the union, if you know what I mean. So I think, I think a new union charter, somebody needs to write it. <laughs> mm, that's, that's a great idea. I do want to actually, since we have some time, I'd like to share some of the comments that some of the guests made. Um, Nancy said, God is in the pause as much as in the pace um, she, that you said that. She loves that. Um, she said that this is a guiding principle in homeopathic prescribing, you know, sort of waiting and watching while my, mm. mindful of the pace of the disease. It's sort of matching the remedy, you know, with, with everything. So I thought that was interesting. And then also, um, uh, Alistar said the, the root of the word charity is, is the Latin caritas, which is about friendship. I wonder what the world would look like if we shifted our language about charity away from giving stuff to others and more towards friendship with others. Human connections, there's no substitute for it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And what are your thoughts around that with regards to technology? Well, you see, I connection. Yeah, I'm an, I'm an analog mind that lives in a digital world. <laughs> you know, so for me, for me, I think there is something to be said for technology and what it's doing with regards to advancing, you know, our ability to live longer, medicine, research, all the various components, you know, the comforts that we have because of what technology does from being able to travel uh, efficiently across the world, you know. So, so I think there's a lot to be celebrated about technology. But, you know, the greatest journeys in life are from one heart to another. You don't actually have to move. And I think that's what embodies life in many ways. So I think human engagement, I think, will never go away. I think if you look at the future of education, we talk about AI and people are going to be irrelevant and you can't do this. And, you know, you're bringing up children in a jobless world and what's going to happen. I think we don't need to be dystopic about all of this either. I think I think what do we have which is unique that makes us human? We are critical thinkers, we can communicate, we can be compassionate, we are creative. And these are sort of things we need to celebrate about who we are as human beings. And then the more we can create those bonds, you know, the stronger life gets, you know, then the better it gets. And, and, you know, relationships are exactly the same as religion. If you think about what makes religion powerful, what makes religion powerful is an irrefutable truth you know, God is X, Y, or Z in your belief language, that Jesus is this, whatever. So, so you have an irrefutable truth, which is a profound ideology, and, and you, don't, you don't challenge it. Supporting that irrefutable truth are a series of non-negotiable rituals that you, that you conduct in order to create, to empower that ideology. So whether it's Sunday mass or whether it's Friday prayers, whether it's going to the temple on Tuesday or it's, you know, fasting on for Lent, et cetera, et cetera. So an irrefutable truth supported by non-negotiable rituals. Mm -hmm. relationships, relationships are exactly the same. We live in a world where life is a negotiation. If you really love your nearest and dearest, there is an irrefutable truth, then you have an obligation to create rituals that are non-negotiable uh -huh. to strengthen your bonds with, your, with, with those relationships. And that's all we have to do. We have to humanize what we read in books and apply them to the person right next to you. Wow. Well, that is a beautiful segue because I know that our time is up. I'm not yes. sure could, uh, you could have said that more perfectly as a, as a final comment, uh, Grev. Thank you for that. No, thank you for having me. This has been, uh, you have seriously uh, opened my definition uh, to this term compassion uh, to a much, much broader uh, 
concept and idea and, and it's expanded and I thank you for that. It's uh, what a gift that you have given to, uh, to our audience. Well, thank you very much for having me and I, and I hope the, 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 you know, the audience enjoyed the narrative and the conversation and uh, very grateful, uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you both You're so welcome. much. It, this has been a real pleasure. And like Olivia said, this has opened me in a, in a way that I'm so very pleased and excited about. So thank you for your time and um, your compassion and being here with us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thank Kate. You. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.